same superstars who take up a good part of the rest of this evening as we begin a celebration of the group that won their first battle for fame at a Eurovision Song Contest. And we move now across into Sweden, the largest of the Scandinavian countries. And although we're looking at streets, it's a country full of mountains, lakes and forests. And of course, it's full of blonde Vikings. And uh, this is one of the reasons why it's good for pictures. These are the ABBA group. And if all the judges were men, which they're not, I'm sure this group would get a lot of votes. <laughs> La chanson Eurovision 1974, c'est Waterloo, la Suède avec Waterloo, chanté par ABBA. You can't guess my secret from looking at me. There are no outward and visible signs, no giveaway look in my eyes, no telltale scarring that might tell people passing me in the street that I'm a fan of the Eurovision Song Contest. Seriously, I can't get enough of it. I wish it was monthly, weekly even. It was the contest, as I call it, that first brought ABBA to our attention. What is it about ABBA anyway? In the 1970s, when I should have been humming Pink Floyd B-sides, I caught myself humming ABBA singles. Now, when I should be humming Nirvana B-sides, I catch myself humming Abba sings. Yes, I'm down and feeling you, and I don't know what to do. Oh, green, green, why don't you give me a call? Green, 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 why don't you give me a call? People used to put them down in the 70s at the time, all the sort of trendy music press would sneer at them and people would be inclined to say, well, anybody can do that sort of thing, but of course they can't. Maybe it's just a lot of us have grown up and and kind of remember the music that we were listening to when we were younger, as well as Bowie and Lou Reed, who was, for me, Abba, you know. I think they made millions, but they had to pay for it so heavily. They had to wear those clothes. I think anybody who's going to wear those hideous outfits should be paid millions just to do that. Oh, ring, ring. Why don't you give me a call? Ring, ring, the happiest sound of them all. Hello, I'm the first B. My first name is the same as the famous tennis player Bjorn Borg. Hello, I'm Anita. I know it's very hard for you to pronounce, but you can say Anita or you can say Anna. Hello, I'm B for Benny. Uh, I just wonder what you people know about Sweden and the Swedes. Hello, I'm Anna Fried, the last day in ABBA. We all met because uh, that we liked music very much. Oh my God. I can't do it now, we can blah, 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 blah. ABBA recorded their first song, People Need Love, in that golden year, 1972, that all four members had already dipped their toes in the chill waters of Swedish pop. Bjorn Ulvaeus was a member of a terminally drippy mob of acoustic guitar strummers, all polo necks and collegiate hair, called the Hootenanny Singers. Bodacious. To be only mine, baby, those are the rules. Baby, those are the rules. Don't you dig me? Benny Anderson was a sort of scando beetle as keyboard messiah with the Hep Stars. Where do they get those names? Born of them 
Anifrid Lingstad met Benny in 1969. She already had a recording contract with EMI, having learned a load of Swedish folk songs, light-hearted stuff about fish and suicide, one fears, from her gran. And yet a Falskog gave up a job as a telephonist to become Sweden's answer to Connie Francis. Imagine that. She met Bjorn in 1969, overlooked his taste in clothing, and married him in 1971. We all met because of our interest in music, and also because the boys fell in love with us girls. The man usually described as the fifth member of ABBA was their manager, Stig Anderson. Stig gave the eager youngsters their new name. There was a bit of a problem with a local fish canning company called ABBA, but it passed. ABBA went on to sell over 240 million records worldwide. <laughs> Stig Anderson obviously said to himself, what I need is two boys and two girls, and what I need is a song that goes like this, because I know Stig very well, and he's, a, he's an incredible record man, and I think that where fate and history takes apart later on, I think somebody at the start needs to say, what there's not in the Eurovision is two girls and two boys, so I'll put two girls with you two guys, and, you know, this is a package. It's almost like the Beatles being hugely successful in Great Britain and then getting their wives in. The one thing that ABBA do is they sing pop songs. And whenever anybody sings a pop song with conviction and to the quality that they always maintained, they were always going to be successful. I have been cheated by you since I don't know where. So I made up my mind it must come to an end. Siren-type voices are, are always very high and nasal that pull you into the song, and I think they both got it. They were almost they were like Barbie dolls, weren't they? They were like Barbie and Cindy. So you would like have the two of them matching, redhead and blonde, and then the ugly guys at the back. <laughs> What's the name of the game? It's a very surface appeal of, you know, pretty looking people and, and a slightly kitsch look, slightly kitsch music at times, and then these really great tragedies, really, you know, and it is true, you know, sure it's because it was just grown up enough without being burdened with the r real neurosis, you know, and then they have the side that you can only really listen to if you're really drunk or something. Take drugs or alcohol or anything like that? No drugs. No drugs. <laughs> no drugs. You're clean. <laughs> no, not clean, but we don't take any drugs. <laughs> An occasional drink. The 70s was a time when English pop music lost all its nobility and all its pride and went to America. And I think ABBA came along and it was a very innocent music and they weren't ashamed to be corny. Perhaps it's something to do with the lang language but, you know, they didn't re really understand all the words. People accused them of finding their lyrics on the back of cornflakes packets. Um, that aside, you know, we've all done that in desperation from time to time. But 
I think it's their innocence that appealed initially. They weren't scared of using rinky-dink sounds, you know, dink, 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 dink. I just knew that they'd be successful when I saw them on that dreadful seaside show, singing SLS. Frida always look uh, absolutely beautiful. You wear lovely clothes on stage and off, Thank if you. I may say so. Do, do you design them yourself? No, we have a designer who designs it for us. Do you have a favorite Everyone. outfit? Yes. Um, personally, I like to have jeans and pullover. <laughs> Casual. And how about yes. you, Frida? I like about the same stuff, yes. Casual as well. Friday night and the lights are low. Looking out for a place to go. I think it's always a little bit sad. I mean, ABBA had a very... They tried very hard to be hip and never really quite made it. Making your sort of international debut on Eurovision Song Contest, you're headed for disaster because you have to have a sort of all-singing, all-dancing outfit. And then once people like you on that, you can't go into jeans and, a, you know, a T-shirt. You have to keep getting worse and worse and worse, which they did. The boys had a fundamental problem in that their haircuts were so horrendous. You put anything on with those haircuts and they're going to look bad. Let's face it, nobody actually wanted to grow up to be Frida. They all wanted to grow up to be Agnetta. And so she was always the plain one. In fact, in some cases, she looked a bit like uh, Agnetta's grandmother. She had this terrible curly hair, brown for a start. You know, blondes have more fun. It says something here about Dancing Queen. Now, which one is the dance? <laughs> That's one of our songs. Oh, oh, is it really? Oh, what a disappointment. <laughs> there goes my novelty Okie Koki. <laughs> now, what other songs have you done? Take a chance on me. 
Oh, he's... <laughs> Was the way that you wrote songs together evolving? Has it always been the same way, or yeah. has it changed? No, it's been the same all the time. Yeah. Can you Apart from that, that, Bjorn always write. I never write any lyrics. But you used to in the beginning. <laughs> yes, that's why I don't do it anymore. Yeah. I thought some of the lyrics didn't travel very well, and I felt that some of the songs uh, were taken too literally. You know, they they used to explain things more than they needed to be explained, if you know what I mean. Uh, <clears throat> and it used to make some of the words sound a bit corny, but uh, on the other hand, I, I think the, uh, the, the tunes were so nice anyway, it used to make up for it, really. I see that you're all so sad, The ABBA songs, like Beatles songs, like Holland Dozier and Holland Soil, uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, delivered you the song. They told you what the song was and why it was written. There was no hairy fairiness about it. You know, it was like, this is what the story is and here's the payoff. And if you, you know, they understood that and they delivered that every single time. So when you heard an ABBA record, for instance, you never, ever really listened to it. It was like, it was almost like music. It was perfect. Knowing me, knowing you, there is nothing we can do. Knowing me, knowing you, we just have to face it this time. We're through. Breaking up is never easy, I know. They make a sort of melodrama in the music. They have these big flourishes. But the drama is definitely creating the voices. You have to be pretty good to get away with the talking bit in the second verse of No Me No New, where Agneta kind of echoes all the words that Frida sings, like, and in the video she's in this little kind of gauze halo, and she's saying, Memories. I mean, that's like the Shangri-Las or something. That's, that's like something that's so kitsch. You know, if anybody else do it, you just laugh. But for some reason, it's, it's, it's tragic when they do it, you know? And it's the accent, I think. It's really the accent. It's not a racist observation at all. It, it's true, that accent is very poignant. People speak, they speak very deliberately, and like this, you know? People do it now much too much. It's much, it's much more precise. For one thing, they speak English probably better than a lot of English people do, you know, so. People picked up and project all kinds of weird and perverted theories about about the, you know what they're trying to express. But the the main thing is that universally, when you just hear the song at chance, you're dropped right into the melancholy of it. And yet the you, the image of them is this bright, shiny pop group. There's a really melancholic part in there, and in the choruses particularly, that you cannot tell how many voices are working there. And all the flourishes, they don't have so many of them on there on this particular record. But we stole them like crazy, and they, they drag these things into pop music, um, these big uh, double octave flourishes on the piano that seem to like they're straight out of Rachmaninoff or something. <laughs> 